So we're at Book Market at Whippy, Ontario, and with me is David Damchuk, who wrote The Bone Mother. Mm -hmm. And uh, your background is in playwriting, and the beginning of this book felt like short monologues for theater. Well, that's exactly how it began. I, uh, I started it as a new project, and I assumed it was a theater project all the way along. Um, and it started with um, the series of monologues that you see that were set um, back in the era prior to and leading into the Second World War. And so there are just a series of individual first-person stories about the villages where the characters uh, are situated, the uh, factory, the thimble factory, where um, some of them live, some of them have uh, certain disturbing experiences, and, and but also just stories of family, stories of the countryside. And uh, at first, I knew the stories would be related to each other, but it was unclear to me how they would relate and, um, and how the entire process as well as the narrative would unfold for me. And I was about, I'd say, the fourth or fifth monologue in when I thought to myself, this is unusually good for me. <laughs> I, know, I have a sense of what my level of writing is, and I was surprised at what I was tapping into, and that um, some of the pieces just almost literally wrote themselves. And that's, of course, when you have information like this, you kind of have to put it back in the back of your mind and just keep working. But, uh, but I, was, I was really surprised at how the content was coming together as I was working. And then I was also surprised at the through line that started to emerge. And I thought, okay, I'll just go with that. And, uh, and stayed with the framework that it was going to be um, a series of short monologues. For the stage version, um, I wrote a total of 20, and I selected from those, I'd say about 13 of them, and that came to about a two-hour piece. And, uh, and that went very, very well, and I was very happy with that, but I always had the other seven sort of in reserve. And, uh, and then I folded them back in when uh, I was encouraged by a couple of people uh, to pursue it as a book. And then, so I did. No, the st when I first read it, I thought, oh, well, this is, this is monsters. This is monsters talking to me, or creatures, let's yeah. say, creatures. The majority and, of them, yes. Yeah, so, well, the first three or four, certainly, yeah. and linked by the fact that it was in Eastern, Eastern Europe. Yes. You weren't really sure where. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, first, I wasn't sure if it was real or, or kind of a imagined real mm -hmm. um but so are you ukrainian Did oh you yes oh you are yeah, i'm totally ukrainian on my father's side and really the book um i had worked i'd been in theater for many years i dealt with in some of my writing um family history on my mother's side uh, family issues on my mother's side i had never really dealt with anything on my father's side and i and i had a really strong and complicated relationship with uh, my father and my grandparents and his whole side of the family. They had a farm which you can find, but basically by following one of the stories as a map in, uh, in uh, The Bone Mother. Uh, my grandparents had a farm 200 miles outside of uh, Winnipeg and we would visit there uh, a few times a year. And nearby was um, the town of Sandy Lake, which uh, was entirely Ukrainian. and. Even though I didn't live there, even though I visited infrequently, everybody in the town knew who I was. The, the man who ran the general store knew me my, knew my face, knew my name. It was, it was that, that uniquely sort of rural experience, but also uh, very specific to Ukrainian culture. And, uh, and a big part of that was hearing stories as we were driving up in the car, you know, don't go near the lakes, you know, a Rusalka's in the lake, you know, she will come and get you, <laughs> which was a very effective way to keep your child from drowning and, uh, and, and stuff like that. It was, and so uh, I always had a fascination with horror as I always had a fascination with fantasy and folklore. And, and I knew there was a lot in, in Eastern European folklore and mythology that just wasn't commonly heard in, in Western culture. And so I was, you know, it was always in the back of my mind, I really should do something with that. I really should explore that. And this became an opportunity to do that. 
Well, one of the only ones that I knew was Baba Yaga. And, yes, of course. And, and of course, that's the bone mother. That's the bone mother, absolutely. So why attracted to that particular fairy tale or oh, that particular story? Well, she's, like, she's a central figure in Eastern European folklore. Uh, there are many Baba Yaga stories. They all have a similar kind of framework. Um, she's especially intriguing because she's, uh, she's very different from the Western European model of the witch in the woods who is, you know, very Hansel and gretel -y. You know, she's, she's there, she's waiting for you, she is clearly a villain, she is going to either eat you or transform you or do something to you. And, uh, and Baba Yaga is entirely different. Baba Yaga can be wonderful. Baba Yaga can be horrible. Baba Yaga can make terrible mistakes that work out in your favor, Bear, you know, or, or she could eat you. And uh, <laughs> you just never really know what you're getting with her. And, uh, and she applies trials and tests to the people who come and visit her and want things from her. And she, was all, and she had a sly sense of humor like just the darkest kind of quality. And the, you know, the animals and birds in the forest were all sort of, you know, we'll help you escape her, we'll help you, we'll help set you free, you know, we'll do this for you, we'll do that. Because they themselves know, you know, there are ways around her. And I just found her to be just a delightful personality to, to investigate, to inhabit. She was just a treat. One of my favorite lines in the book is where she talks about the difference between eating good children and eating bad children. Do you want oh, to yeah. share that? Yeah, good children do taste better, but <laughs> but they're in such short, short supply. <laughs> uh, if you can if you can uh, accustom yourself to uh, eating naughty children, uh, you'll always have food on the table. I I just thought this was uh, it was just so much fun to be able to uh, to be able to characterize her. And I mean, and her story in the book is a poignant story because her granddaughter is coming to visit her and doesn't really know that her mother is this, this major for folkloric creature and doesn't really know what's in the cages that are sort of back over by the kitchen. And of course it's children. And, uh, and at a certain point she realizes and she asks, you know, Baba Yaga, I mean, my Grandma, are you the bone mother? And she goes, well, I might be and I might not be. <laughs> and, uh, and, but at that point, the, the grandchild discovers that she is part of the line of, of women who will become the bone mother and that it's inevitable that she's going to take her grandmother's place. And, uh, and she struggles with that. And, uh, and her grandmother has to guide her through that struggle. Um, that was that was one of the real turning points for me when I was writing was when I got to that piece and I thought I can see how this can all come together. I can see how I can I can create a world that people will want to uh, spend at least a little time in. Well, and so many of the stories are about family, even brothers or yes. or fathers and sons and mothers and daughters. Mm -hmm. um, and no, but the other thing I should have perhaps started with this. One of the things that I found fascinating, because I did think these were fake, I did not think they were real, were the photographs at the beginning oh. of every book, and then to find out they inspired you. Yes, absolutely. Um, it's going to sound strange and clinical when I describe how the project came about, uh, but there were a number of things that I wanted to do, and this was sort of the project where I could bring them all together. One was exploring uh, Eastern European fairy tale and folklore. Another was working with monologues, which I always enjoy doing. And then the third thing was I had never worked with prompts before. And, um, and so I, and I had thought to myself, it would be really great to do a stage show that had images that I could project because finally we were at a, at a point in theater where you can do that now fairly inexpensively. And so I thought I will look for some uh, images that are in the public domain that evoke the kind of period and the, and the kind of environment that I'm looking for. And, uh, and I did a, a search on, of all places, Flickr, and I came across the photographs of Kostika Xinte, who was a Romanian photographer in the years leading up to and into World War II. And most of his work was portrait work that was done in small villages. And the, the archive of his work uh, was in the process of trying to restore and preserve uh, these images. Uh, many of which had suffered terrible damage. So you have 
uh, in the images, all of this dark splotching and all of the image lifting off the negative and things like that. And this, I mean, they were, they were some of them creepy images to start with, but this just like took it to a whole other level. And so there were hundreds of photos, but as I was looking through, I thought, oh, I can easily find 20, 30 photos that I can work with to sort of, you know, inspire whatever it is I would like to write, the characters that I'd like to create. And, and that was literally what I did, was I, I printed out, I think, 40 of them, uh, and then just sort of put them around on the living room floor and just, you know, would pick one. And the first one I chose was the, uh, what we know to be two brothers st sitting together very formally with a bouquet of flowers between them. I thought, okay, I'm going to start here. I'm going to see who these people are. I'm going to see what world they're in. And it just flowed from there. And uh, the photographs are, were a huge component in the creation. They were a huge component in uh, the production. I had a, a multiracial, multi-gender cast who actually spoke the monologues, but you could see clearly who it was that they were representing um, in the projections. And then uh, it became a focal part of the book. I th the, the book really, um, I think, is taken to a whole other place thanks to the photographs. Yeah, I, I, it's a funny thing because, as I say, I thought they were fake mm. because they are so great. Oh yeah, you know they no. don't. They look like these are really, really creepy. Yeah, some of the people I realize now that the photographs were taken when they really didn't know what that apparatus was. Yeah. So it might be stealing your soul. It might be yeah. a weird thing. So they have these strange affect happening oh today. yeah they're very they have a very solemn i mean they want they're they're beautifully eastern european themselves they have everything that i like they're, there's an aura of melancholy about them it's so you're looking at and going are these an artistic statement what is really going on here and um and the people are are in in most cases are quite poor but are 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 wearing their best clothes they are trying to project an aura of of some kind of uh, level of comfort um, and normalcy. They are and normal. normalcy, and yeah. and and yet, I mean, for one of the most striking images is the final image in the book. Uh, there's a young woman who's wearing a very simple um, dress uh, with uh, a simple pearl-like necklace, and she's blind in one eye, and uh, and it's just a transfixing image, and the and the decay of that image um, again elevates it considerably, and you can't help but look at her and think to yourself, who is this person? How has she come to be in this situation? Why why does she have such a captivating aura about her? And one of the things that is an undercurrent in in the book is around disability, is around. Um, changes and violations of the body, um, how people um, adapt uh, to those changes, and uh, and how people in many ways are in conflict with their bodies um, and their representations of themselves. And so that was yet another um, way to sort of you know pin that down. All of this sounds like it, it's uh, about the past and and the the war period, but. Mm -hmm. You but. then, you, but, <laughs> wait now, um, but then you've got a, a handful of contemporary pieces, which was really fascinating because all of a sudden now, not just talking about the community that was happening in the Ukraine, mm -hmm. you now have the diaspora. These are the people that have left and come to Winnipeg. Yeah. So how did, was that just your family background? or um, that... Some of it is absolutely my family background. Um, what happened was, Again, it, you know, it's going to sound so hilarious. Uh, I wrote, I wrote, I guess altogether about uh, 21, 22 pieces, and uh, and then I uh, thought, okay, I should really look into publishing these. And so I asked a mutual friend uh, uh, of Chaisine Publications, which is uh, Tony Burgess. I asked him if he would advocate on my behalf and see whether they were interested. And Brett wrote back and he said, these are really great, I like them a lot, where's the rest of it? And I was like, what do you mean? And he said, this is half a book. You, I, That's you very would, astute of him, too. <laughs> you, yeah. would have to, you would have to write another half. And I was like, oh my God. So that point, I thought, well, I cannot possibly do another 20 short pieces and knit them into this world that are all set in the past. And that's when I thought, 
what I really need to do to complete the story is talk about the descendants of the monsters and the creatures that come to the new world and um, and that bring uh, their monstrousness with them. In some cases, bring some cases bring their ghosts with them, and uh, and that's where um, the book reached yet another turning point. Well, that's I think when it becomes a novel. Yes, up absolutely. till then it wasn't a novel. No, it's, but it it's, was so, it changed. Yes, it uh, it by pursuing what happens in the present with um, a variety of characters where you can see the lines sort of tracing back to uh, characters we've seen before, to situations we've seen before. That's where I think um, the whole book really does sort of come into its own. And I know that uh, for many people, it's a shock when they go from reading four or five of these quaint little stories that are set in the past, and suddenly they're reading about trucks and Tim Hortons and cell phones and, <laughs> and, and uh, things that are so just utterly contemporary uh, after, after this almost sort of warmly nostalgic kind of period. And then immediately after that, they're thrust back into the past again. Yeah, no, I, that to me, and I, it made me think about, one of the things that made me think about was the stories that w usually women tell their young children yes. and this concept of the fairy tale. Mm -hmm. Why is that such a, a powerful form of storytelling it's well, so powerful well it's if i it's a form of storytelling that's used in, in i would say you know almost every culture um there are there are legends and cautionary tales that we tell children um partly i think to equip them to deal with uh the hazards of uh growing up in the world you know whether it's the hazard of you know stay away from the lake or stay away from you know I don't know, strange women in the forest. Um, but also just, you know, there will be conflict in your life. There will be loss. There will be things that you'll have to encounter and you'll need to figure out, if I'm not around, how you're going to manage around a situation. And, uh, and they try to apply some, you know, in some ways, some logic, some common sense to uh, what can sometimes be senseless and disastrous situations. So I think that that's, I think those are powerful for us because they're among the very first stories that were told. We learn a lot about how storytelling works from the way that fairy tales work, even though there's often a dream logic to fairy tales uh, that makes them even more enticing. And, uh, and I think that they become the framework for the stories we tell, whether or not we become writers in later life. You know when you start a story with Once Upon a Time, it immediately puts you in a particular um, a place mentally in a particular sort of context and, and you just go with the way the story is told. Fantastic. Nowhere to really go from there. So my last question to you sure. is, um, so what advice would you give to the young writers starting out? I mean, you, you're a benefit of several decades of being a writer and a playwright. What would you say to some young writer who's coming into the field? Well, if you're coming into the field, um, the most important thing to do is to, first of all, write, and secondly, write some more. And as well as that, find out through, mostly through experimentation, what works best for you. How uh, you hear a lot about, you know, oh, you have to write every day if you're going to be a serious writer, which is not necessarily true and is not something that many people can maintain. Oh, you have to write a certain number of words. Uh, no, you don't. I'm, this book was written 250 words at a time, a thousand words a week over a year. That's 50,000 words, that's a book. Um, and and any time that I wasn't writing, I was taking time off. I was certainly reading and researching. I was certainly bouncing ideas off of people. But it's finding your own pace. It's uh, determining what your strengths are. Uh, it's finding your people to a certain extent. Uh, I don't think that it's as important now to have, particularly when you're first starting out, to have an agent, to have uh, people representing you, as much as it is to have people who will advocate on, on your behalf, who will stand up for you, who will connect you with other people. And uh, I also think that when you're ready to publish, I think there are many more venues for publication, not necessarily wealth, but 
publication um, than there ever have been. And uh, many publishers, particularly small publishers, are more approachable than they've ever been before. But mostly, it's like work on your craft, write over and over and over, be prepared to be rejected, don't let that deter you. Those are, those are the critical things. And, in, and I didn't mean to add on, but I feel I have to. And in your case, once the book was published, you had almost immediate acclaim. I mean, what was that real oh, like? That was a total shock. <laughs> <laughs> we, I, had, I had no real idea. Um, when you go with a small publisher, you get a small advance and you get a small print run. And I had thought to myself going into it, I thought that's as much as I'm ever going to get. It, I'll, the advance is as much as I'm ever going to see. The book will take two or three years to sell out its print run. And it's a lovely book, so you and have a nice a, object. And I was very proud of it, and and, uh, and obviously still am. And But that was as far as I ever was going to see it go. The first clue we had, that I had, the publishers may have had earlier clues, but the first clue that I had that anything was going to happen with it was when we got the starred review in Publishers Weekly. And um, and I at that moment... I was thrilled because, oh, that's good. That means it will get into libraries in the United States. That's really is at, at least will make a big dent in the print run. I still wasn't thinking about awards. I would never have thought about them. And I was certainly wasn't thinking, you know, as far as it's gotten today, like two years later. It's still remarkable to me. What a great way to end. So thank you very much, David. Well, and thank you very much for having me. It's been wonderful. <laughs> As you could tell, I can talk and talk and talk. <laughs>